So in the first video, you actually got to see the chemical reactions taking place. In the second video, I'm going to go through and look at what actual reactions are going on, what do the chemical reactions right now look like, and a little bit of how do they connect to the trim. So the first type was we took some kind of oxide, either a non-metal, a metal, or something in between the two, uh, and added water to it. So let's go through each one. So non-metal, or metals, I'm sorry, metallic oxides or anything over here. And so let's do a couple examples of those. So the one that we saw in the video was magnesium oxide. So we had solid magnesium oxide powder, we added that to water. What do we make? So you also want to be able to produce what the chemical reaction is that occurs. When you combine these two, they form a single compound made out of magnesium oxygen and hydrogen, and that is a base called magnesium hydroxide. Now, if you're just in trends and you haven't really gone through the whole IB stuff yet, you might not know a lot about this, but if you've gone through acid base, what's happening here is that the oxide here is pulling a hydrogen from the water to make the hydroxide, and the, the water itself has been left with the hydroxide, and so you end up with two hydroxides and a magnesium. So it's an acid base reaction where we end up producing a basic product. So one of the things you want to know is that if you add a metal oxide to water, you'll end up producing a base. And you can do that with any metal oxide for the most part. So sodium oxide will end up making sodium hydroxide and so on. Now the tricky part is when you start to get close to the staircase, that starts to shift a little bit. So in the second one, we did kind of a metal towards the middle of the periodic table. So let's do zinc. That's an example there. And when we add zinc oxide to water, we end up making zinc hydroxide. And again, if you're just getting started in IV chemistry, this is probably a little more advanced for you. But the key idea here uh, is that we, in acid-base chemistry, we end up producing something where the hydroxide is basic. However, zinc, unlike sodium or magnesium, actually does carry some acidic properties with it. And so the full detail of that, if you want to watch that, there's a link in the description of this video looking at zinc hydroxide in particular uh, in what's called an amphoteric compound. And amphoteric means something that is both an acid and a base. And so this component of that is acidic, this component is basic. So overall, we, we present kind of a neutral or neutral-ish type substance uh, really, it's a little more complicated than that. As we continue progressing across the periodic table, now we start to get into things where we're dealing with uh, non-metal oxides. So if you've kind of missed this up until this point, metallic oxide, we have a metal plus oxygen. A non-metallic non oxide, we have a non-metal plus oxygen. So the trend is going that we're going from basic to neutral, now we're going to get into the acidic part. So the way that you want to do the reactions for these is you just take your non-metal oxide, you add water, you're going to end up producing some kind of acid. So you're going to have hydrogen something, and the other thing, if it's oxygen involved, is going to be a polyatomic ion. So you want to look and think, what are some polyatomic ions I can make between phosphorus and oxygen? So we've got phosphate and phosphite are the obvious choices, and when you pick, if you pick incorrectly, you'll find quickly that it's impossible to balance. So I'm going to pick incorrectly here, and I'm going to go with phosphate. I'm just going to pick the wrong one there. When I go to start balancing this, I see a 2 and I see a 3. So I put a 2 here and a 3 here, balance my hydrogens. And then I also see that I have two phosphoruses and two phosphoruses. So I have six oxygens, I have three here and another five here. So everything is balanced except for my oxygens. but I'm locked into these ratios because the ratios of hydrogens are good, the ratio of the phosphoruses are good, and there's no way for me to change one of those but not the other with where I can end up with a different ratio of oxygens. So this just will never balance no matter what you change the numbers to. However, if instead of doing that, we pick the other polyatomic ion possible, which would have been phosphate, which is still a three minus charge, so I still have three hydrogens, now, very easily, I can go through and balance this because that'll be a 2, that'll be a 3, and I think we're done. Yep. So, if you run into something that's easy to balance, you picked correctly, SO2 plus water, uh, we're going to 
different things, sulfate or sulfite. This one ends up being sulfite. If I pick sulfite, H2SO3, sulfurous acid, everything is balanced and I'm good. If I picked sulfate and had sulfuric acid, I would be here forever because it would never balance it. So in this case, the non-metal oxides are end up producing acidic solutions. And so the trend is, as you move from here to here, you go from strongly basic to more neutral to acidic to stronger acidic. And as you go, in particular, the phosphorus sulfur row is interesting because you go from phosphorus to sulfur to chlorine, you go to phosphoric acid to sulfuric, which is stronger, to perchloric, which is even stronger than sulfuric. And so you're kind of illustrating the trend that the further away from this side we go, the more acidic these things become. So our second type of reaction is an alkali metal reacting with a halogen. And the key thing I would stress to you here is that at the top end level, at the level of a six or a seven in IV, you want to have a solid understanding that the thing that makes alkali metals reactive is that they have a very weak hold on electrons. One of the big themes of trends is is that some things are really good at pulling on electrons and other things are really bad at pulling on electrons. So when you look at an alkali metal, let's look at uh, sodium. And for halogen, now halogen, those are all diatomic. So when we do this for simplicity purposes, we're gonna break this down using chlorine as, as atomic just to kind of simplify the discussion. So when we look at sodium, we have this 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So our 3s1 is our valence electron. If we look at the Bohr model of that representation, we have three energy levels. We have 11 protons, two electrons here, eight in the second shell, the 2s2, 2p6. And we have one valence electron. So if we look at this valence electron, what we find is that this electron, this one right here, is pulled in quite a chunk by the 11 protons, but is also repelled quite a bit by the 10 core electrons. So all 10 of these electrons are all repelling this a decent amount. And so net, there's not a lot holding that electron in place. So if anything that can come along and take that electron away is going to do so. Now to contrast that, let's look at a halogen. So if we look at chlorine, all right, we're just gonna look at a chlorine atom here. We have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. We have 17 electrons, and again, we have three shells. The chlorine obviously would be much smaller. I'm not gonna be able to get my points across if we shrink that down to actual relative size, I think. So chlorine, on the other hand, has 3p5 and 3s2, so we have seven electrons in the valence. These seven electrons do not repel each other very much. So when we look at one of our valence electrons, or even one of our spots for advanced electrons that has a vacancy, if we compare how much pull, we now have more pull inwards than we did over here where we had 11 protons, but we don't have much more repulsion outwards. So what that means is, is that chlorine is much better at pulling on its electron here in the valence than sodium is, which also means that since we have the capacity for another electron, and when these two collide, this is going to move over to here. So we're gonna end up with a 3S electron moving over here, changing this from 3p5 to 3p6. So we essentially are mixing things that are really good at losing electrons with things that are really good at taking electrons. Now from there, most of the writing out of the reactions is fairly simple. So sodium plus chlorine, we're going to end up producing the salt that we can make from those, so sodium chloride, balancing we would need a 2 and a 2. But what's really important that you're able to understand is that Within this, we have a neutral metal starting and a neutral molecule to start where this has 11 protons and 11 electrons. These each have 17 protons and 17 electrons, but these are charged. This is a plus one charge. We have 10 electrons here and 11 protons, and this has a minus one charge. This has 18 electrons and only 17 protons. So there's been a transfer of electrons because this was better at pulling on the electron than that was. From there, any other reaction we do, whether it's potassium plus bromine, whatever, it doesn't matter, you're just gonna end up making the salt. And they're all plus one, minus one for alkalis and halogens, so it's really simple, you just have to watch out for diatomics. Our third reaction type is when we mix an alkaline metal plus water. Let's go ahead and use sodium as our example here. And again, 
from number two, our key idea is that this is really good at losing electrons to things. It doesn't flaunt its electrons very well for the exact same reason. So even water, which might be hard for us to think about as in terms of flowing electrons, is capable of stealing electrons. Now this one, people have a lot of trouble with predicting the products. So if you can actually look at a visual of this, I recommend it, you'll see two things happening. One is you'll generally see some type of fire, explosion, or very violent reaction, along with lots of bubbling. That bubbling, what's leading to the explosion, is that you're making hydrogen gas. So hydrogen gas is bubbles, it's gas, and it's highly flammable. So if you, if you go down in the description on this video, I'll link the alkali videos, uh, alkali metals video that I have. So we produce hydrogen gas as one of the products. So many high school students would then assume that you make something up with the sodium and the oxygen. So they would assume you make a sodium oxide. And that's a smart thing to think, and perhaps you do, but sodium oxide in the presence of water, as we saw in, in step one, or reaction one, that ends up reacting further to produce what's sodium hydroxide. So even if I had made NH2O, that NH2O would then further react with water particles and go ahead and produce sodium hydroxide. So the two things we make for an alkali metal plus water is hydrogen gas and then a base. Okay, and if you look at most videos, they'll often add phenyl phthalene to the solution, so you see the pink color rise. The balancing on that is a two next to everything except the hydrogen for the alkali metals. I do want to caution you, there is a very similar reaction. It's the exact same thing going on, but calcium is, is reactive enough to do this reaction as well. So in calcium reacting with water, you make hydrogen gas, and then calcium hydroxide. But because calcium forms a two plus charge, it affects the balancing a little bit where you will have a two here, and then everything else will be balanced. Okay, besides that, sodium, lithium, and potassium are really your only common alkali metals. All of the other ones are ones where you're looking at a situation where you know, rubidium or cesium is just so rare. So lithium plus water, really if you know the sodium one and memorize that, it's an easy transcription into this. Here we're gonna make lithium hydroxide, and hydrogen gas, we're gonna have a two, a two, and a two. Our fourth reaction type is a halogen plus a halide. So I'm going to go ahead and do a couple reactions for this. We're going to start with bromine, our first two. We're going to add bromine to sodium iodide to one reaction. And let's go ahead and flip that around and do iodide plus sodium bromine. Now this shares the tendency of some of the previous reactions where this is an electron transfer reaction. So one of these things is going to be better at pulling on electrons and therefore Whenever you have pairs like this, here's the iodine is charged, here the bromine is neutral, here the iodine is neutral, here the bromine is charged. Whenever you have two reactions like these, one will happen, one will not. Okay, we'll kind of try and go through and explain why that is. All right, so first of all, halogens are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Halides are the charged versions of those. So iodide, bromide, chloride, and fluorine. Okay, so in this case, this top reaction will happen. We will end up making an iodine and sodium bromide, and the balance we would need a two and two because of the halogens. And this reaction, nothing would happen. And you may have learned in chemistry that the reason why this happened is something about dance partners and a more attractive, a less attractive dance partner, and they're switching, they're not switching. That's not really what's going on here. The sodium here is completely irrelevant. What's actually happening is we need to look at what the charges of things are. So bromine is a neutral molecule with no net charge. The iodide, on the other hand, is a minus one charge. The iodine is a neutral molecule with no net charge, and the bromide is a minus one charge. So if you're just getting into IV chemistry, you haven't done a lot of looking at this, but if you've seen the redox unit, then you should be familiar with this. Well, what's happening is the bromine is changing from neutral to negative, and the iodide is changing from negative to neutral. That is because electrons are moving from one thing to the other. That is electrons moving from here to here. So what that, that implies is that the bromine, for some reason, is better at pulling on the electron than the iodide is, and therefore it takes the electron away. Now if we look, here the bromide has the extra electron and the iodine doesn't. So since bromine is better at pulling on the electron, there's no way for that electron to move back to this. And so the reaction happens this way, but it doesn't go in reverse because this is better at pulling in the electron and it has the electron. In the terms of a thief and a victim, this is the better thief and it's already stolen the stuff. So this is not going to return back to there where this person already has that extra electron. 
Now, if we look at why that happens, when we look at, let's look at a little simpler thing. Let's go with fluoride or fluorine versus chlorine. So I don't have to draw as much here. But the fluorine, we have nine protons with nine electrons. One is two, two is two, two be five. And if we contrast that with chlorine, let's go ahead and switch colors here. So the chlorine has 17 electrons. It's got three energy levels. So if we want to look, analyze why is the why are some of these better at pulling electrons than others, we've got a lot of different changes going on. So one, the number of protons changes. This has more protons to pull on electrons with. But if we look at where we're adding these electrons to, our spot to add them to is in this outermost energy level. And this spot has a lot more electron repulsion going on. So this has more proton attraction, but it also has more electron repulsion. And those two factors somewhat balance. So there's a third factor that's kind of the tipping of the scales, and that is this has more energy levels or N or energy levels. And what that does is it places the electrons further away from the nucleus. And so this being a little bit further from here actually creates a weaker pull on those electrons than this would have. So as we move down the group from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine, this is the most reactive because it is the best thing at pulling electrons. And this is the least reactive because it is the worst thing at pulling electrons. And we can contrast that to go in the opposite order. Fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. Fluoride is the best thing at pulling electrons, but here it has the electron, so it's not going to react. So this is now the least reactive of the halides. As we move down, now we've got the weakest pull on the electrons for the halides, and so this would be the most reactive. Interestingly, that's reversed from the alkali metal situations we looked at earlier, because in the alkali metals, the thing that makes them reactive is their ability to lose an electron. Well, the further away the electron is, the bigger the atom is, the more energy levels we have, the easier it is to take. So for the alkali metals, it's flipped, where if we want to go kind of from cesium to rubidium, let's do this in order actually so it doesn't get super weird. So if we go from lithium to sodium, potassium to rubidium to cesium, this is the most reactive. And the lithium would be the least reactive for that particular group based on what they're trying to accomplish. So adding in some understanding of what these things are actually doing in terms of pulling and, and not pulling enough on electrons adds a level of understanding that makes the understand or ability to produce the reactions much, much better.